Libby Trickett is known as much for her infectious smile and beautiful personality as she is for her talent in the pool. Libby joined her first swim club in Townsville when yes. she was just four years old and 24 gold medals later. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah, oh, Libby, you're incredible. So what was growing up like for you with all the training? Because that's a lot of pressure on a young Yeah, kid. yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think... Oh, I mean, growing up in Townsville, it's so hot up there, you just want to be in water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I learned to swim very young. Yeah. And I think from the moment that I, I guess, joined my first club and had my first club night and the races and had that sort of um, experience of competition, that I just fell in love with swimming. Yeah. And uh, I think that real love of swimming just slowly snowballed into what became my, I guess, my swimming career. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say that I was one of those um, really hard trainers right at the beginning. I was, I was very well known as a bludger <laughs> in, my, um, in my club and in my squad for a really long time. But as soon as I made the connection between training hard and the performance in the racing pool, which mm -hmm. was around the age of 14 or 15, um, once I made that connection, that was when my swimming career really started to accelerate. Yeah, wow, wow. Um, so did you feel like, because those teenage years, mm. everyone's having a lot of fun, you know, yes, all these parties lots of and parties, yeah. so much fun to be had. Yeah. Did you feel like you were missing out? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I, again, I think because I had this real love and passion for swimming, when I had to make those decisions and, you know, decisions that could be seen as sacrifices, yeah. they didn't feel like sacrifices at the time because they were just what I needed to do to achieve the things that I wanted to. In so swimming. you had that in your mind? Yeah, it was just, it wasn't even like a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I did my fair share of partying and, you know, was going to parties and things from about the age of 15. But I went to, I had two nights at schoolies when I was, when I left school mm -hmm. and I just changed coaches to the coach that would go on to take me to, you know, um, multiple Olympics and, and medals and things like that. And I just changed into that program. I had two nights away and I kind of had a glimpse, I guess, of what the alternative would be. And I realized, I guess, coming home from that, that I really wanted to take swimming seriously. I really wanted to absolutely put my all into seeing where my career could go. Yeah. Um, and so I'm grateful that I had those, I guess, partying experiences and, and you know, got to go to schoolies, even though it was only for a short amount of time. It really allowed, it really kind of, I guess, felt like a fork in the road yeah. and allowed me to make that decision really clearly. Um, yeah. And so, when I had to face those decisions later on, they didn't feel like sacrifices. They made, they felt more like a commitment to yeah. what I wanted to achieve. Yeah, so yeah. when you have that goal in mind, it's easier to do yeah. those things. And, that and don't get me wrong, it was still hard because mm. I did miss out on a lot. I missed out on um, uh, my husband Luke's, his brother, and his wife's wedding. I didn't get to go to the wedding because yeah. I was away. Lucky you got to go to your wedding. Oh, well, thank goodness, yeah. <laughs> but I only had one. I only had one we uh, weekend that oh. year that we had oh. to oh. be able to do the wedding. So it was very limited choices. And yeah. you know, yeah. I think as you get older, and maybe the commitment to your swimming started to wane, that's when it felt like sacrifices, yeah. and that's when it felt harder to make those commitments. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you did still miss out on a lot of things and, you know, you catch up with friends and you'd see and, cat and see what they'd been up to over the weekend and, yeah, you'd, you'd sometimes feel that tinge of, um, I guess, missing out. Yeah. But, yeah, at the end of the day, I had those goals in mind. Yeah. So. And look, you've probably had so many amazing experiences. Mm. So what are some of the most memorable moments? Oh, gosh. Um, it, I, I think the Olympics is really hard to go past. Um, the Olympics were a beast unto themselves. It's every single Olympics was its own unique experience for different reasons. You know, the um, Athens being my first, and being in um, Greece, and and getting that experience of the Olympic Village for the first time. Beijing was incredible in so many different ways. It was easily my most successful Olympics. 
Um, so that made it nice. Um, the food there was incredible. Mm -hmm. And then London was a very different experience again after coming back from a retirement yeah. and um, making my third Olympic team. So it was a very different experience at all meets. Um, but I think probably outside of uh, Olympics, the 2007 World Championships in Melbourne were probably my favourite. They were easily my most successful so, meet. So why was that? Why were they your favourite apart from um, being so successful? Well, a few reasons. It was you know very successful, which is always really nice because yeah. you make that commitment and you want to get those results. Um, a couple of days after the Worlds finished, we had an exhibition meet where I unofficially broke the world record for the 100 metres freestyle. Um, which was amazing and then yeah. a couple of days after that I got married so yeah. oh. in terms of a two-week period of time in my life it yeah it there's nothing huge. that comes close I mean obviously having my baby girls very, <laughs> <laughs> very amazing but in terms of yeah. you know a, an individual pursuit it was yeah. incredible yeah so Libby you actually retired twice yes so <laughs> what what was it like retiring because Swimming was your whole life. Yeah. So how do you go from, it, it's such a big change. Yeah, it was. Um, I felt really prepared for retirement. I felt ready to see what the world had in store for me. So was the first time just a little practice? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think I thought all those things yeah. and the reality yeah. is very different. Okay. Um, and I think any time that you make a massive transition in your world, it's really confronting and it really shapes you in different ways and changes the way that you think and um, kind of expect life to roll. Like I just kind of assumed that I would fall into a job. I had no mm. real experience in anything, um, but I assumed that job opportunities would happen. Mm. Um, and the reality is very different. And I did get some opportunities, but they didn't feel right. And coming from a place where I've had so much passion and so much love for what I was doing and really clear goals and really mm. uh, a clear identity of who I was and lots of very obvious feedback and I knew how to value myself in different ways in different environments because of the way that I'd been conditioned for so mm. many years in the pool but when you go in, into the real world that's not the reality you know yeah. um, swimming is very black and white I like to say whereas the real world's very gray yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do I didn't know what I, what I wanted to be I didn't know what, how I could channel my energy anymore and so I fell into depression during that time yeah, I put you're very outspoken about your mental health yeah and and that's because of my experiences yeah. um, you know I have had not only personal experience with mental illness but also having had to be the support person of other people in my family yeah. and friends um, and close loved ones with mental illness as well. So yeah. I've sort of seen it on both sides and it's hard and it's really difficult when you're going through it. It's hard and really difficult when you're supporting someone else through it. Um, so yeah, I think that was the first major experience of mental illness that I had had. Um, mm. I think swimming and the amount of exercise I was doing really masked a lot of probably underlying issues. It gives you a huge amount of endorphins, so yeah, yeah. I think it um, really does mask a lot of what you're experiencing. And it's all about performance at that stage. So um, you're not actually going into how you're reacting to situations or things that might have happened in the past that might have been difficult to yeah. process. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that first retirement for about a year, I was probably pretty um, severely depressed and really struggled mm. to, I guess, get out of bed and sort of with my usual energy and yeah. um, intention. So uh, the only way that I could see getting back to me was going back to the pool because that's the environment that I knew. That's the mm. um, that's how I knew how to value myself, and I had a really clear goal of wanting to make a third Olympic team. So when you said you know you were struggling to get out of bed do you think you knew that you were depressed or did you think that there was something wrong with you um i think i had an inkling but it really takes a long time to acknowledge that yeah. and then to take the next step to get help yeah so it's it's a process you know it's it's really uh it really makes you vulnerable yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. realize that you feel like you have a mental illness and you feel very weak and as though everybody else in this world is coping okay 
um, and somehow I can't mm. cope. And that's not the reality. The reality is, is that I think it's one in four people will experience some sort of mental illness in their lifetime. Yeah. Like that's a yeah. huge, that's a quarter of our population and, in Australia. And even outside of mental illness, everyone has time, struggles, times when they're depressed. Or... Life can be really hard yeah. and sometimes we need help. Yeah. Um, and you may not have mental illness, but you may be struggling. Yeah. And um, whatever position that you're in, it is okay to ask for help. And I think that shows a real strength. And um, I think people think vulnerability is a sign of weakness, but I think it's a huge sign of strength. And if we can talk about it and normalize it and say, whatever your experiences are, whatever background that you come from, you are allowed to ask for help. You have mm. the permission to ask for help. And mm. that is only going to do you a great benefit in the future. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so when you retired the second time, mm. were you a bit more prepared for what the you know, were you expecting to feel that way again? I had more resources in my tool belt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they talk yeah. about having yeah. tools in your tool belt. And I think I knew what to expect. I yeah. knew that if I fell into a depression or if I started to experience these same thoughts and feelings that I would be able to ask for help sooner. And that yeah. has helped me and served me in so many great ways in my second retirement. I think, um, I think the thing that I didn't anticipate was how difficult tra the transition into motherhood would be for me. Mm. That was mm. something that I probably didn't anticipate yeah. so much. Probably nobody does, but no, I, um, I really struggled with that with my first daughter. Um, and yeah. nothing can really prepare you for it. And, and you kind of have to go through it yeah. to learn and grow and evolve. I think when you have that new little person in mm. your life too, you lack so much sleep. Yes. And that is... So for me, that was the primary, I think the primary cause of why I fell into postnatal yeah. depression. Um, Poppy, my oldest, bless her heart, is a beautiful little girl now, but she just had a real aversion to sleep <laughs> from the minute she came home from hospital. Um, she, to be fair, she slept pretty well at night for the first maybe four months, but then I don't know whether it's that four month sleep regression that people talk about a lot, mm. but mm. she basically decided that sleep was no longer for her and she was waking every 45 minutes that for so about five months. And nothing can prepare you for that amount no. of sleep deprivation. Nothing no. can prepare you for that chronic fatigue that is just mm. in your bones and just does not allow you to make decisions. Um, so yeah, I've, I really struggled. Mm. and. I think that was my scariest time with mental illness because it wasn't about me anymore. I was having really dark thoughts about my daughter. Um, I wanted to disappear. I, I, I wanted to go away, but I was thinking very dark thoughts about Poppy and was incredibly angry at her and very mm. resentful. And like that still causes a huge amount of guilt for me now. It's almost like you're talking about a different person. No, I was yeah. I was not of sound mind, yeah. um, which is really scary. And you know, you yeah. try to do the self care things. Yeah. And my rock bottom was trying to drive to a mums and bubs class at the gym because exercise is a real mm. form of self care for me. Yeah. Um, but Poppy also hated the car so she mm. as soon as I put her in the car she started crying and it was about a half hour drive to the gym and from about two minutes into that drive I she was crying and I lost it completely lost it I was screaming uncontrollably at her mm. to to be quiet or to shut up or whatever I, I actually don't even know what words mm. I was using mm. I was just so lost yeah. in that yeah. moment and somehow I got to the gym I do not remember most of that trip which is scary yeah. enough as it yeah. is being yeah. heavily sleep deprived yeah. um, and almost having like a mental break it felt like mm. and I got to the gym Poppy had finally quite fell asleep because she was so tired from crying um, and I realized when I got to the gym that I needed to ask for help yeah. like that was not someone who was okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, yeah it was a really hard moment to experience and to still live with yeah. um, but I'm so at the same time I'm really grateful that 
that moment did happen and thankfully no one got hurt or yeah. you know we didn't have a car accident or anything like that um, you have to be easy on yourself too yeah and, of course you know, and yeah. I, now i can talk about that story without yeah. bawling, <laughs> oh, <laughs> falling into a, yeah. a ball of tears yeah. but um i just think it's a really important story to to tell as well because you realize that it doesn't matter what your life might look like on the outside. It, it's what you're experiencing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's mm-hmm. the difficulty with mental illness is people put on wonderful fronts and, you know, I'm happy and everything's fine. Um, and, yeah, so it's just really important to make sure that you ask for help when you can get it. Um, so, Libby, how important was exercising in those dark times in in your diet yeah I mean it's so important I think to have well what I've discovered is it's so important for me to have that self-care routine um, and to have a mental health checklist essentially and so for me I know that if I'm starting to feel overwhelmed or stressed um, or like I can't cope in certain situations then usually there's a reason usually I haven't had Good amounts of sleep which can be difficult with two little ones yeah, 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 um, yeah. but as much as possible getting good consistent sleep yeah. um, making sure I'm exercising regularly and that you know ebbs and flows as well because yeah. life is busy but basically I try and make it as much of a commitment as I possibly can um, and you know make a plan with my husband throughout you know when we're both going to exercise throughout the week so we can both give each other that time yeah. Um, yeah. to commit to our physical and mental health and then you know diet and exercise I mean I think when you're exercising regularly you naturally make better choices mm. with your diet and mm. your nutrition That's and very true. I think you know when I'm feeling good about myself I want to put good things in my body yeah. so yeah I know for me, like at home, we live on a cattle property, so yeah. um, if if I feel you know a bit down or something, I can get on a horse and go for a ride. Yes. And just I come back a different person. And, so and this is the thing, people need to understand that self care looks different for different people. Yeah, yeah. Um, me getting on a horse might not end so well. <laughs> yeah. Well, me getting in the pool, I may yes. need resuscitating. <laughs> this is it. But it's about finding what works yeah, for you. It yeah. might be reading a chapter of your book yeah. every night or yeah. sitting with a you know quiet cup of tea yeah. of an evening after kids go to bed or yeah. whatever it looks like for you. It might be meditation. I'm not someone who can kind of sit and meditate um, as much as I have tried because yeah. um, I think it's important to try these things yeah. and see if they work for you. Yeah, um, yeah sitting for 20 minutes... It, saying om is not going to work for me Um, but my meditation is through movement and through exercise and it's just about finding what works for you and and committing to that self-care because you can lose yourself in your exercise so that's what it switching your brain off so for me it's getting out of my mind and into my body yeah so So Libby you are very generous with your support for lots of different organisations, yeah, Beyond Blue, you. Starlight Children's, mm. Fred Hollows, yeah. and you have added Sisters of the North to your yes, list. Yes, I know. Clon Curry is very excited that you are going out there. I'm thrilled. April. I'm so thrilled to be yeah. able to go out there. And I know um, Ben Dobbin, Dobbo, yeah. is coming out there yes. and he's thrilled to, to sort of show me the ropes and show yeah. me around as much yeah. as he does. So yeah. really excited yeah. to be a part of the event. And So how come, what made you decide to get involved with Sisters of the North? Well, I mean, I think it's all in that name, right? It's Sisters of the North. And I think women helping women um, is so fundamentally important to me. The only reason that I was able to do what I did in my life was because of my mum and the amazing women that I have in my life. Um, And so, you know, there's been such difficult times um, in the area and anything that I can do to help... you know, live and live limb up yeah. the mood, or yeah. Um, yeah. you know, take people out of the difficulties that they might be facing yeah. in their own life, and just to have a bit of fun because I think sometimes that helps in those oh. situations as yeah. well. Absolutely. Have you ever been to a camp draft before? I haven't. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I will make sure that if I'm not there, someone will be there to tell you exactly what's going on. I know. Well, again, so. having spoken with Dobbo, he's very excited. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I don't know why. He yet. said he needed an Akubra and, and some RMs. So he we'll have did. to come work he, on that. He did definitely told me to bring jeans, which I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, yes, yeah, I can 
can bring jeans. Yeah. I don't have a Nakubra or my RM William boots. I, but well, I might be able to find one. Okay, can borrow. <laughs> that would be great. I would really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks so much, Libby. My for pleasure. Your time. I'm so pleased oh, to meet you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Libby. Thank thanks you. so much for watching our video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please try to remember to just click on the subscribe button so we can keep you updated with everything that's happening. Thank you.